Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Aude, the Alawai Canal Flood Project. To discuss this uh, matter, we have uh, three uh, people who have been active uh, on that uh, project uh, from the community, of course. Uh, uh, Sydney Lynch, uh, she's president of Protect Our Alawai Watersheds. And um, then we have Dave Watase, he's a civil engineer and a community activist. And he has a website called stopalawaiproject.com to give information to the community about uh, that flood project. Uh, they'll be talking more about it. Um, and then we have uh, Luciano Minervi, he's a professor emeritus. Uh, from the University of Hawaii Manoa Department of Urban and Regional Planning. So welcome all and uh, we shall start uh, by having uh, um, Sydney um, have um, a PowerPoint uh, uh, originally done for the um, uh, association, uh, the Protect Our Alawai uh, Watersheds uh, by Dave Rainey. Well, thank you, Ibrahim, for having us here today. It's a wonderful opportunity. Um, my name is Sydney Lynch, and I'm the president of Protect Our Alawai Watersheds, which is a 501c3, which was formed in October 2019 to bring awareness to the community about the proposed U.S. Army Corps Alawai flood control project. Uh, I live on the upper part of Waimau Stream in Palolo. One day, I discovered a flyer from Dave Watasi on my doorknob giving information on this project, a portion of which would be happening about 300 yards, a football field away on the stream. My neighbors and I were not at all aware of the project, and as we quickly learned, the plan had many flaws. The project was quite advanced in the funding process, put together with the help from the community, the legislature, and certain members of the city council, we were able to force the Army Corps and the city to meet and talk with the community for their input. It was a collective effort across the three main areas, Makiki McCulley, Manoa, and Palolo, with Dave Watasi tirelessly going to seven neighborhood boards each month to engage and educate the board members and get them involved. We reached out to the people at the University of Hawaii, various schools, and groups that were doing more environmentally friendly and alternative types of water absorption and mitigation, and held an educational forum in October 2019, which was widely attended by not only the public, but city council members, state legislators, and the Army Corps. Now in April 2020, a new plan is being considered and the community's input is being sought at every level. However, the Army Corps has severe restrictions on its parameters when creating a project. Community feedback is that effective flood mitigation must take place across all organizational levels from the Army Corps, city, state, and community university to build a holistic solution. For me, the key issue that quickly became apparent is apparent is maintenance of any structure that would be built. In June 2019, we visited three existing detention basins to see what looked like and were horrified to find that all of them poorly maintained. The stream that the Wailupi one uh, is on experienced a major flood in April of 2018 with debris blocking the bridge by Kamehameha Highway and flooding nearby houses. The following slideshow was put together uh, for Pacific Protect Our Alawai Watersheds by Dave Rainey. So we visited, visited three uh, detention basins. This is actually a ponding basin. It's behind Roosevelt High School. And uh, one of our people in our group uh, lives nearby. And this was built in a, about 20 years ago, but it's pretty much abandoned. It's on uh, Hawaiian Homestead property. And when we got there, it's filled with weeds, as you saw. So the the culvert was blocked by sediment and the stream rarely flows through the culvert. The stream actually is, is pretty inactive, but they have the uh, the forks before the culvert to catch the debris. And the city is responsible for coming in and cleaning out those forks. And this one was not too bad. There is some accumulated debris. Under the bridge, it was silted up. The, things could still pass under the bridge, but it did need to be uh, cleaned out. The other side of the detention basin is actually a cement uh, has a cement floor, but it has been filled in with silt and debris and is totally overgrown. So this is where all of the water and debris comes out. And obviously, if a lot of water and debris comes down, it's just going to flood all over the place because 
there's nowhere for the water to go. It can't continue on its path very easily. So what is the purpose of a detention basin? Detention basins are meant to collect storm water and slowly release it at a controlled weight so that, that it downstream areas are not flooded or eroded. And what does a functioning detention basin lo look like? So we went uh, out to East Honolulu to look at uh, some examples out there. The first one was in Hawaii Kai, the Hahaoni ones. And these were built uh, probably about 25, 30 years ago because when that area was developed, the houses were allowed to be built right up to the hillside. There, it's a very steep hillside and there's really only about a couple feet be behind the houses for water to come down. And about 20 years ago, they had a massive flood down the middle of Hawaii Kai. So they put these two detention basins in. This one here, the detention basin one is about 30 feet deep and is basically a large hole. And there is a, an opening on the other side for the water to go out. So the water comes down from the stream, which is to the right of the basin and collects in this hole. So you can see the hole at the top underneath the, the tines that are sticking out there. So when we went there, the homeowner next to it uh, let us come in and look at it. And as you can see, they have these trees growing out of the, the weep holes. So <laughs> when we asked the Army Corps, we showed them this photo and the, one of the Army Corps people said, well, that just shows you how uh, strong the detention basin is. <laughs> and we said, no, it shows that there's, uh, they're not being maintained. And we had asked the, the homeowner how often the city comes by and he said very rarely. So we did mention it to them and I think it has been cleaned up to the Army Corps and I think that the city has cleaned it up since then. So this is the other one that's in that area and we were not able to get a closer view because it's, it's a gated area. But you can see where the water comes into this hole and then there's a channelized stream that takes the water uh, down, down the valley. Then we went over to the next valley uh, in Ainahaina and they have what's called a, a boulder detention basin at the top of the, of the area, it's way at the top. And below that is not, it's channelized, but it's not cement, it's all dirt. The, the residents there didn't want to have concrete there. So um, a lot of debris, a lot of dirt comes down along with debris. So there's the basin, it's about six feet tall. This was built by the city. And uh, above it, that brown area is all rocks. So this is looking up at the basin. It's about six feet tall and has slits in it for the water to come out. But when we walked on the top of it, you could see that it was pretty much all blocked up on the on the upper side. It was almost to the top. So anything that's gonna come down, it's gonna go right over that and continue on down the stream. And there are a whole bunch of boulders that we didn't get a picture of. And that's the, the one that flooded in, I think, 2018. The valley I live on is Waimao. And you can see the red areas is where they were going to put the detention basin. And this would have been a, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but a 30 foot high by 70 foot uh, wide and 100 foot long. And this is the area where it would have gone. Right here, the stream is only about 30 foot. So they would have had to dig out both sides to put in this huge structure, which is going to be an earthen structure. And when the Army Corps talked about it, the man who was in charge at that point was from Alaska. And he said, well, you know, we're going to put in this earthen berm. It's not going to be concrete and we'll have grass growing on it. And everybody who lives in the valley was like, well, everything's going to grow on it, but grass. You're going to get all kinds of invasive plants. And this is uh, on the stream a little farther down. This is behind the elementary school. And this is, again, it's like a little debris catchment. And as you can see, it's not cleaned. It does catch the debris, but unless you go in and pull it out, it's just going to be useless in times of a larger rain event because everything's just going to go right over the top. So the city is responsible for going and cleaning out these kinds of things, but they just don't have the manpower or the, the money to do it on a, all the time. Our site visits have identified and documented major problems with the use of detention basins for flood control on the island of Oahu, largely uh, from a failure to properly maintain them. Then the next paragraph talks about the proposed basins which the Army Corps have since uh, deleted from their plan as they would not be able to hold enough water. So at the original plan, the Army Corps is estimating it costs about a million dollars a year to maintain that. And there is no dedicated maintenance budget. Uh, the city pulls from a pool of money to do any kind of maintenance projects. So basically whatever is the most high priority is where the money goes. Uh, we would like to see anything that gets built have a dedicated maintenance budget. 
this is talking about the previous plan. They had planned to put one of the detention basins on a charter school that's also been removed from the, the new plan, as far as we know. And the community really wanted to see uh, using the Alloy Golf Course as a detaining the water and uh, other ways than building these detention basins up in the upper valleys. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sydney, um, for that. Um... Uh, so um, I understand uh, like you're opposing additional detention basins uh, because of the bad maintenance, et cetera, and that because also there's a better way of doing it, a more efficient, et cetera, that saves uh, the city um, and county uh, quite a bit of money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and headaches yes. too, okay. <laughs> and uh, however, there's um, each of the... Uh, those uh, <clears throat> proposed uh, better way projects uh, would have uh, need to have a dedicated maintenance uh, um, fund, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. we would really like to see that. And there is precedent for that. There's a project uh, in Santa Barbara, California, where they had a massive fire and then flood, and the citizens got together and put in um, some kind of uh, mitigation, and they also went and got a $1 million endowment to fund the maintenance. That was part of the plan. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, now we go to uh, Dave uh, Watase. He's a civil engineer, as we mentioned before, and community activist. And he would uh, uh, tell us more about um, his uh, involvement and how he got uh, to be involved and all of that. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to the Island Connections, and I appreciate this opportunity to give a presentation. My name is Dave Watase. I became a stakeholder in 2015 for the al -Wai Flood Project because my property was targeted for the One Mile Detention Basin, which was one of seven upstream detention basins. This forced me to read and understand with a critical eye the 2015 draft EIS, the 2017 final EIS, in the 2019 Engineering Documentation Report, abbreviated EDR. <clears throat> As a key stakeholder, according to the Army Corps' own public engagement plan, I should have been engaged um, years earlier rather than only for the last public uh, meeting held in September 2015 for the draft EIS. I wasn't the only one that was left out of the public engagement process, and others numbered in the hundreds. I started a website called StopAllawaiProject.com. I successfully convinced seven neighborhood boards to pass resolutions for the 2017 final EIS and again for the 2019 EDR in opposition to the project elements. Unfortunately, I've had to spend thousands of hours fighting the poorly selected design alternatives by educating and informing the public, neighborhood boards, city council members, and elected officials in our, in our state legislature about the issues and concerns. I would say there are hundreds of written testimonies buried in resolution and bills at the neighborhood board, city council, and leg state legislature. <clears throat> I'm not against flood mitigation, rather the alternatives that were selected by the Army Corps. Prior to 2018, I never testified in my life. I was a quiet person who kept my opinions to myself. I didn't realize the importance of public scrutiny and evaluation. I spent days and months studying the draft EIS and final EIS only to conclude that most of the document was filler space to confuse and maybe legitimize the study by sheer number of pages versus the content. Yet many critical details were left out of, like hydrographs showing the peak flows and durations at, at the proposed detention basins I couldn't find storage volumes for the detention basins or the flow rates and pump sizes for two major drainage outlets at the far end of the Alawai Canal. I quickly realized that the problem was that many of our decision makers don't have time to study and make good sense of the EIS. They just have too many bills and projects on their plate. They, they assume that the Army Corps is the expert authority and they hedge that everything is done correctly. All the Army Corps had to do was show the 3D 100-year flood model of Waikiki flooded to the H1 freeway to our congressional leadership, our governor and our mayor, 
And the answer was a big yes to support the $345 million project that had secured federal funds. For the record, I hope that the Army Corps abandons all selective alternatives of the 2017 EIS and the 2019 EDR and starts from scratch. What I hope the Army Corps retains and carries forward are the voices of the community and those who are most impacted. It would be quite sad if everything the Army Corps, every time the Army Corps runs into a headway, they quit, they rescope their project and purge the voices. If you look at the slide, this is the Army Corps 3D 100 year flood model that was transmitted to all the different news organizations. It included a similar panoramic video that was used on TV. The Army Corps claims a damage figure of 1.14 billion in property damage to 3,000 structures. But when you really look at this, you have to ask yourself, can this flooding really happen? Well, yes, it can. But I think the question is, you know, um, is it an accurate model of the 100-year flood? So if you um, consider how the methodologies are done, flood models are derived from historical flood information and data. The Army Corps used three storms, uh, the 1967 storm, the 2004, which um, the flood uh, was a result of Woodlawn Bridge being overtopped and the water running down through the University of Hawaii causing about $85 million in damage. 2006, uh, they also used that storm. That was when we had 40 days of rain in a row. The ground was saturated. And I think that was only a five-year storm, a very small storm, but because the ground was saturated, and that's something that the Army Corps doesn't take into consideration. They have no measurements on ground saturation. Uh, Makiki got flooded. And, um, you know, I think what we have to look at is, um, you know, what is the probability of a storm like this occurring? And then whether or not it's economically feasible um, to protect ourselves from a storm like this. So this slide is, shows two modelings that the Army Corps uh, produced uh, in their final EIS. The slide on the left is the 10-year flood, which has a 10% chance of occurring in any given year. And the slide on the right is a 100-year flood that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. Uh, the Alawai Canal has 100 years of history, and to date, we haven't had any flood that represents even their 10-year flood model. So uh, immediately, I kind of questioned their modeling. I think I thought it wasn't calibrated correctly because if we had the flood on the left, the 10-year flood, according to their modeling, everybody would think it was the 100-year flood versus the 10-year flood. So my third slide right here shows the 1965 flood overtopping the Alawai Canal. The Alawai Canal has topped basically three times in 1965, 1967, and during Hurricane Iniki. The Alawai is rated to handle a 20 to 10 percent uh, flood, which is a five and 10 year flood. Uh, and if the canal, if they're saying the canal can hold, you know, that flood, you know, why did it overtop on smaller storms? And why do they show the modeling showing all this flooding uh, in the picture on the right, where the 10 percent flood actually floods out the, the whole area when they're saying that the canal can handle a 10-year storm. The EDR plan that the Army Corps came up with in July of 2019 shows the removal of the six upstream detention basin, and those are the uh, red circles with the X on it. And they added in a 4,000 CFS pumping station in the middle of the Alawai Canal. Uh, they put in a Makiki bypass, and they decided to use the Alawai Golf Course as a detention basin. And in reality, I thought that was a very good call because the Alawai Golf Course is really the biggest area and it dwarfs all the other upstream detention basins. So these were some renderings of what a detention basin looked like. Uh, the one on the top is the Kane White Park multipurpose detention basin, you know, behind basically Hokulani Elementary School. The school was never informed about the project or the Army Corps' intent to put in this detention basin. Uh, the bottom picture is uh, the four-foot concrete walls that would have surrounded uh, the Alawai Canal. 
Uh, and whenever you go above ground, you have to basically cap off the existing internal storm drainage system. And that in itself would cause flooding to Waikiki and the areas Malka of the Alawa Canal, because they would basically close off the drainage system for several hours during the peak times of the storm. Okay, uh, alternatives, there are a bunch of soft alternatives. Uh, they really don't apply to uh, the bigger storms uh, like the 100 year storm because those involve quantities of water that basically are too great. The ground saturates and it just, you know, you get the runoff. That's why they call it a 100 year storm. It basically happens, you know, once in a lifetime. But um, right here, uh, you could go with residential underground detention storage. Uh, people also, uh, this is done places on the mainland. I pulled out these designs. Uh, I Googled underground detention storage for residential areas as well as businesses. And these are just some of the things that uh, I found on my search. Uh, you could incentivize it like solar panels, give tax credits and rebates uh, for people to take care of their own you know, runoff from their roof and their hard surfaces on their own private property. Okay, the next slide shows rain barrels. You know, that's already available. You can get rebates from the water water supply. Uh, businesses, small businesses and small buildings, you know, they could take care of their own water uh, from their uh, parking lots and so forth. And they could go underground. They can also repurpose the water by saving it and using it to uh, irrigate their landscape. Okay, on a, on a bigger side, uh, and sometimes done in uh, some foreign countries, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, where water in some locations are very scarce. They actually catch the water when they have the big storms and they use it again to repurpose the water for different uses. So uh, some countries you know, do it on a big scale because the fresh water uh, isn't available. You know, they have to even go through osmosis to convert seawater into drinking water. The Army Corps did consider floodgates and flood pumps but they really poorly implemented uh, the use of pumps and gates. I think a floodgate at the Alawai Boulevard Bridge would be very beneficial. You could close the gate ahead of a storm and drain the level in the canal so that the canal acts as a huge detention basin. Uh, you can do that in conjunction with uh, the Alawai Golf Course, which can also be a huge detention basin. Uh, but the Army Corps put their flood pump, a giant pump, you know, at the very bottom of the canal. Now, the problem is the water doesn't flow in the canal. So it made no sense for them to evaluate a pump at the tail end when the problem was trying to get the water to that location in the first place. But they went in there and they sized it you know, to the maximum peak flow uh, that would be needed for the storm. And it was like 20,000 CFS. And they claimed that it would be the biggest flood pump in the nation. You know, but it totally a misuse of, of engineering. Uh, same thing in their EDR, uh, they basically put a 4,000 CFS pump in the middle of the Alawai Canal. Now, if you think about it, why would you put a pump and a floodgate in the middle of the canal when the problem is you want to get the water straight out to the ocean as quickly as possible? So they would be basically pumping 4,000 CFS, almost half the capacity of the canal, into the canal from one side to the other side, but they really wouldn't be able to turn the switch on until the front side drained down. And that's the problem. Versus if they took that water and pumped it straight into the ocean underground or through a tunnel, that would have been much more beneficial and the pumps could be running through the whole duration of the storm rather than just when uh, the front side could take the water. So to me, that's a misuse of how they did it. I had created my own little map. I basically Googled uh, the upper watershed. And again, I put some pictures uh, when we had a presentation to the community of different options that could be used on the upper watershed, you know, with underground detention storage, include things like bioswales, you know, and underground detention basins on the district parks that are basically laterally positioned off the stream rather than in the middle of the stream. And like Sydney uh, mentioned, uh, the Waimao detention basin wasn't just 100 feet long, it was like 1,000 feet long uh, when you look at the whole area that they would be basically destroying a uh, natural stream basically to protect something from the uh, hundred year uh, flood. And in reality, those detention basins hold anywhere from, I'm estimating ha half a million to a million 
a cubic feet of water. The duration of the storm and the water involved is like 350 plus million cubic feet of water. So I really question how several detention basins that would just basically hold back maybe 10 million cubic feet of water would actually protect um, the residential areas as well as Waikiki and the University of Hawaii. My ideas have evolved as I've learned more about the project and as more information became available. This was done at the time of the EDR and right about when Oceanet came out with their SWIFT plan using subterranean tunnels. And I really think that's the way to go. Uh, Oceanet's uh, plan was for two major tunnels, one up to Manoa Valley and the other one to Palolo Valley. Uh, basically it reduced the impacts to like a 20 to 25 year storm. Uh, it completely bypassed the canal, which is the bottleneck because it's flat. Uh, and it, without a slope, you don't get the velocity of the water. And the slope is basically self-created. As the water comes into the canal, it rises up high and it drains toward the Alawai Harbor. Uh, but you gotta consider that without a floodgate, the Alawai Canal is tidal influenced and if we have an incoming high tide of let's say two feet and you have storm water coming down from the from the mountains uh, into the canal uh, it really won't exit the canal until the level is higher than the ocean the other thing is if we have a tide surge with a major storm that can also basically make the army corps plan of flood walls and upstream detention basins uh, ineffective so I, I really feel that the ocean plan can work. I think it can be improved with bigger diameter tunnels. Uh, it can be improved by implementing a flood pump on the golf course. And I think they can also consolidate it and basically bypass the canal and get it straight out to the ocean uh, in a feasible and economical way. So that's what we're pushing on their reevaluation of the project. And I think the Army Corps based on what we've seen so far, uh, they really are shying away from upstream detention basins. I think they're still looking at the most economically feasible ways of doing it, which may not involve pumping stations and floodgates. Um, I think if they do it, they should do it the right way, uh, something that the community can accept and combine it with ecosystem uh, and soft restoration and softer measures in conjunction with any you know, hard, flood mitigation alternatives. The Army Corps just finished their fourth workshop this past weekend. Uh, if you look at this diagram uh, right here uh, where the yellow arrow is, that's where they're at in the stages of their uh, re-evaluation. The city and Army Corps signed the agreement for the re-evaluation on June 30th, 2021. They're providing $3 million in federal our city is spending one point, up to 1.68 for the non-federal sponsor to do this re-evaluation study. Uh, so currently they're at phase one and they're seeking public input and I'll be modifying my maps and my ideas and I definitely will be submitting uh, my recommendations to the Army Corps. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. Uh, so basically, um, from what I understand, whatever projects they did before on this issue, uh, it was $345 million. I mean, were they all a waste or <laughs> what? Well, I, I, I think if they built it, uh, number one is they actually, when they did their EDR engineering documentation report, they actually determined that their plan didn't work. And that's why they took out the upstream detention basins. Now, it might have been that the community not wanting it and fighting it uh, had a big part in that, but the Army Corps doesn't use that as a reason, a legitimate reason, to not pursue uh, their alternative. So they had to, through engineering and through their modeling, determine that their first plan uh, didn't work or was unfeasible. And uh, it basically validated a lot of the things that we were saying where uh, their alternatives were lacking and we thought it would fail and not work. And they actually agreed with us. You know, in the beginning, they, were, they, 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 compute, they completely uh, were behind their project. And, um, 
you know, by the community and community members speaking up and giving their opinion, it really made a big difference uh, by everybody unifying together, seven neighborhood boards. Uh, I mean, if it was just a, a one or two neighborhood boards, if it was just a handful of people, uh, you know, screaming about it, I, I think they would have just continued forward and and ignored, uh, you know, the concerns of the of the people, you know, fighting the project. So you think like uh, there's um, like they're seeing the light, uh, so to speak, at the end of the tunnel, the one that. Well, we, we're, we're we're hoping, uh, you know, we're not in directly involved uh, in, in the process. You know, we can say what we think. Uh, they basically listen. They go behind do closed doors, uh, and with their engineers and their consultants, they determine what the the ultimate plan will be. You know, um, it would be nice if we were invited into that process because. You know, we are stakeholders. Uh, we have been involved for the last several years, um, you know, working hand in hand with this. Uh, we've attended, you know, dozens of workshops and presentations. I mean, every per year, you know, for the last several years. Uh, so a lot of, there's, there's been a lot of input, you know, and a lot of money even spent by our city council uh, to hire Oceanet, uh, who did community outreach and community engagement and incorporated that into their alternative. And I, I'm, I'm hundred percent behind their alternative, the concept. Um, I think it can be improved and expanded. And hopefully that's where the Army Corps, uh, will, will hopefully it will lead to that kind of plan. That's what we're hoping. Thank you. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, Sydney, you, uh, you put something on the chat. Could you, uh, would you like to say something about it? I, yeah, I, 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 um, 345 million was not spent. That was the original budget for the project if it went through. So the work that the Army Corps did, we don't know how much that cost. The, the city did hire Oceanet to do the public outreach. And I think that was a, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Is that about right, Dave? But yeah, they, they, they didn't spend the 345 million. I just wanted to clarify that. And then now they're going to be studying more like $3 million from the uh, well, yes. and 1.68 from the city uh, to, yes. to do a study. Uh, yes. So I hope they will, there will be like more involvement uh, or taking into account uh, what uh, the community is um, saying, especially like, uh, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, presumably. They are the technical guys, but here there's a, another technical guy, Dave, you know, who's showing that actually these things don't really work. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> if they are Akamai, they will uh, really be listening, uh, you know, to people like you, especially Dave, from a technical point of view. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, uh, did you want to? I think something? part of the problem is, um, although they do have a, a large local staff. Of people who are born and raised here, um, you know, a lot of the decision makers in the Army Corps, I think, are on the mainland, uh, including their consultants. So, Oceanet, when we went down to Oceanet, which is a local company, uh, right in front of us, they could run the HECRAS modeling, you know, two, three different, you know, iterations of it, and uh, right in front of our eyes, uh, the Army Corps basically contracts out the modeling. So they have to send their idea to the mainland, a consultant evaluates it or does the modeling and they have to wait for it to come back to see whether or not their plan will work or not. The other thing is a lot of the ideas I think were done or the people in charge were from the mainland. And when we went, when I went to, a, they had an industrial day, uh, you know, in 2017, uh, the guy in charge of the walls was from New Orleans. And he was in charge of the New Orleans Army Corps branch. And one of the comments he made was, wow, the, the Alwai Canal looks so much different than the Google map. And it was the first time he set foot on the canal. 
And I'm like, how can you be in charge of designing something when you haven't even visited the site or even talked to the locals who, who live there and, and can tell you firsthand the impacts of, of the flood, the problems that they see, and yet without even listening to those people, go ahead and design something and say, this is what you need. So I, I had a big problem with that. And I my preference is that, you know, they work with um, a local firm, you know, and pursue ideas that uh, are more receptive to the community, you know, Thanks. and, and listen to their concerns. Right. And, and, and one reason why their EDR plan was rejected was it, it from July 2019 to January 2020, it jumped from, I think, around $370 million to $652 million in price. And then the county, the partner, basically rejected it. So right now, if they do come up with an acceptable plan, they still would have to go back to try to fund the project, from my understanding. Yeah, thank you. So we have about uh, 18 minutes uh, left. Uh, so Luciano, uh, you also have uh, a PowerPoint, uh, so we can uh, uh, discuss that, uh, see it, discuss it, and then uh, we'll have a few uh, minutes for questions among uh, all of us. Thank you for the opportunity of being in this panel with these uh, two outstanding uh, community volunteer that contributed to have a watershed management properly done. So I have been focusing mainly on the lower watershed of uh, Moilili because I live in the area and I was motivated because I was concerned for the children of Alavai School that are in a flood zone, as you can see from the last big rain of December 5, 2021, the, the water is already on the side of, of the Mauka of Alavai Canal, while the Waikiki side is two feet above. Moilili will flood well before uh, Waikiki, and this was not recognized in the study by the Army Corps. And so be I became involved uh, for that reason. However, my work started early on, even before the Army Corps in 2015, because my three kids were going to school right here in the Alavai Elementary School. And uh, because I've been living here for almost half a century, I've been able to um, monitor the behavior of the canal and the water during the storm and so on. And I was very concerned that the kids' school will be uh, flooded. I checked the tsunami inundation map and I saw that only the front side of Waikiki was uh, exposed to the flood and not the interior and not the, the Alavai Canal. And so I, I, I sensed that this map was wrong because I didn't follow um, flood dynamics. And so I went to the UH Environmental Center and I told the director of the center that this map was not accurate, was wrong. And he was very quiet in listening to this. I think he was one of, of the people that, that uh, uh, did this uh, map of uh, tsunami inundations. And after that, after a few years, I saw that the map was improved because it showed that the water actually traveled up into, into the canal. And so this was an improvement. I was happy that they listened to me and they changed the map. But I, I was not so happy still because it stopped on, on the left side of the map. It's not very clear what people should be doing. And then I check now the telephone book, you can verify. And you can see that here they improved a lot because they put all the Alavai Canal into um, tsunami evacuation zone is the red one. And also the water even goes up, up the streams and also the Palolo uh, Manoa Canal. So this map is more accurate. 
and in reflecting the behavior, the dynamic of behavior of, of the of the water that travel uh, inland. And so you can see that uh, I was right, and uh, the map has been improved uh, by the um, by the government. And so the lesson here is. Uh, if a citizen that live in an Opuaha, they have traditional knowledge of the behavior of the situation. They should speak up because government can improve uh, their uh, documentation. Another thing I did, uh, collecting information and maps uh, of the past, uh, and there is several that I could share with you, but basically you can see that uh, Moilili was a wetland, for uh, taro cultivation and then rice cultivations, and then uh, the canal just came uh, inside. So it was, uh, it has uh, both uh, cultivated field and also um, ducks and fall all over the place. It was uh, an incredible uh, system of uh, um, food cultivation in the city. Looking at the old maps of the 1881, I could see that from the three valleys, Palolo, Manoa, and Makiki, there was, of course, three streams and, or more. And of course, they would go to the ocean with three uh, mulivai, three outlets. And they were serving all the beautiful fish pond that constituted uh, Waikiki at that time. So we can see how nature was operating in the 1800. Then the, ca the canal came in to urbanize uh, the Waikiki and originally was uh, studied for three outlets uh, into the ocean, three mulivai. Then uh, it was designed with two, and you see this one in this map, and eventually was built with one. So the lesson for history is that the canal has been a disaster in ruin the ecosystem, the food cultivations, and while it was designed properly to imitate the, the nature and the topography, it was built incorrectly, and that's why we have only one outlet on the, um, on the uh, west side, and everything on the rest is polluted and jammed up. And in spite of the fact that the, the U.S. Army Corps has authority on, on the flood along the river, in reality, the problem that we have here depicted by this uh, map is that we have a flooding from the stream, we have sea level rise for climate change, and we have also storm surge, and also we have tide movement. So, it's a complex uh, problem, and there is uh, multiple uh, environmental issues to address at the same time. So I think it's very wrong that the bureaucracy, just because it has a particular mandate, don't look at the other consideration. The problem of the watershed of Alavai Canal can be solved only if the federal and the state and the city and for that matter, private sector and the community collaborate with an integrated management plan. But that is not what we have with the old um, Army Corps plan. One suggestion that they made and they actually selected was to build the wall on the Mackay side of the canal and then build another wall on the Mauka side of the canal of Moiliili and then stop at the confluence of the Palolo Manoa Canal with Alavai Canal. And I felt that building the Mauka Bridge and stop over there without continuing up the Palolo Manoa Canal up to Day Street would exacerbate the flooding of Makali Molili or Moilili even more because the water will come in and stay here. And so actually, the plan of Usace would damage uh, Makali Molili even more. So I was concerned because uh, the Mauka community in Palola and Manoa with these uh, leaders 
were very well organized uh, with the community to voice their concern and their suggestion. But nobody was talking for, uh, for Makandi Moilili. And so I felt an obligation to voice that Moilili needed better flood protection because I didn't see anything coming from my neighborhood uh, board. And so I participated at several uh, neighborhood board meetings, several meetings of the uh, Army Corps, a meeting also at the Alibi Clubhouse. There I prepared a three poster that describe the, the flood issues on uh, Moilili and the Alibi Canal and what needs to be done. So I basically reiterated that the banks of the Alavai Canal are not at the same heights. Moilili is lower than, than Waikiki, and so actually uh, Moilili will, will flood before Waikiki. I tried to visualize how the Aupuaha was organized in the past, how the early water control system was done with the taro patches, and, and maintain a flood zone for cultivation. And how instead the centralization of the cement of the canal actually uh, ruined the ecological system. And so because there was a publication by Scientific America on Sponge City uh, in China that integrate flood management and water percolation into the ground, I, I presented the article to encourage uh, the Army Corps, the state and the city to collaborate for a more holistic um, solution. And also I showed the older maps that depict the Alavai Canal with two outlets. And uh, I advocated uh, for uh, that too. So I got motivated because of the tsunami danger for the Alavai school, but then I got very concerned by the maps prepared in the environmental impact statement final report by the Army Corps, because if you can see on the west side of the Palolo Manoa Canal, they have uh, the water that stopped at the Yolani school uh, site like it's stopped by uh, what people called a magic wall because don't exist when instead all the area according to our um, experience of the place is potentially being flooded so this map uh, was wrong and that's why i had to explain to the army corps that the map that was wrong the model was wrong that we, we needed to compare these colored uh, pictures with uh, a topographic map that showed the elevation of uh, this uh, locality in much more uh, detail. And, and so you can see that the water will come down all through and enter Waikiki here if a protection is made for the Yolani school. But uh, if uh, the water is channeled on the Alavai golf course on the left side, then it's possible to put a berm here on the right side and protect uh, the canal. And this is the point uh, that is the lowest in all the, on the canal side. That's why attention should be made in planning the water that go into Alavai golf course that should be used entirely for um, water retention basin. And the golf course should be all utilized as a water retention basin. This will be the better tool to protect the Waikiki and the lower Monili. Next, pollution control can be established with constructed wetlands in the Alavai Canal. And then the water can also go into the, in the Capulani Park after it's been cleaned up and go into the ocean over there. If the water is cleaned up, then there should be no problem in having the second outlet open up or Kapahulu or better along Paki Avenue without uh, uh, touching Kapiolani Regional Park too much. There's been a study done by Dina Vieira about uh, the possibility of having water percolating into private property and streets 
And another beautiful study by Bea Aglibot of, uh, in architecture that show how constructed wetlands can clean up the pollution and so making the, the management plan viable. Very important is to see how the management, the proposal uh, solutions are assessed in terms uh, of measure to be considered. This is a good list, but it's very general. Might not help to sort out what the US Army Corps of Engineering is uh, proposing now. Next. And, and, and this is the, the, the evaluation approach that try to look at a uh, general concept of aloha aina that is uh, perhaps uh, too general to be really applicable uh, in, in our case. Next. The, the blue uh, is the approach used by the Army Corps in sorting out uh, the measure and selecting the one under consideration and the one that they reject because they are not the Akuleana. The, the, the green below is the one that I did for Vipio Valley, where I spell out instead what should be the leading agency and the partner that should help to, to manage and deal the particular solution. This is very important because we are not uh, there yet. And uh, the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, re require federal agency actually to uh, collaborate because uh, the project should be holistic watershed management for restoration plan. So the Army Corps cannot look by itself only at their mandate, but the city and the state should be involved. And I don't see um, documentation for the citizen to see what the city and the state are actually doing. Not only that, but there is executive order that required to look at environmental quality, uh, flood plain management, uh, flood risk, uh, protection of wetland, environmental justice, protection of children and environmental risk and um, safety risk. So there is uh, all these other mandate at the federal level that require the three agency, the three level of government to collaborate. And while they talk to each other, they don't share with us uh, the philosophy of their management plan. Next. And many years ago, instead, students at UH came up with a, an idea philosophical idea on how to restore balance in the Waikiki Aupuaha. And this is the way to go. Thank you very much and mahalo. <laughs> hey, thanks. Uh, just uh, sorry, we, uh, we don't have much time. Maybe we have like a few minutes more. So Sydney, did you wanna say something um, about the better way? Or show that uh, slide. Or... No, no, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, I'm good. You're okay, okay, thank I'm good. you. Yeah, I'm good. So, um, uh, yeah. So um, it's really interesting that um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, doesn't listen uh, to uh, local talent, uh, especially even those they are um, uh, employing here uh, and you know locally. And then they just do everything, uh, uh, you know, off island, so to speak, uh, you know, on the continental US. Uh, so, that that yeah. was before, but not now. They did a very good job in uh, listening to us and incorporating our suggestion. I can see the suggestion of David. I can see my suggest suggestion of other in the table. Uh, I think uh, um, the issues is another one that uh, they don't have a collaborative management plan yet yeah um yeah i'm i'm aware that uh, they are uh, like uh, incorporating some of your suggestions now uh, and so forth so that's uh, a good thing but i mean the shall we say <clears throat> the uh, philosophy uh, of the u.s army corps of engineers that they know better the technical aspects of things you, you know what i'm saying um another thing um you know, the, the last uh, information, um, uh, you know, uh, meeting that they had, I, I uh, watched uh, most of the presentation, like uh, got in five minutes into it, uh, and then uh, watched it. So there was some good information, etc. But I hope they uh, continue listening to 
the community and so forth, that would save a lot of money, etc. Anyone, does anyone have anything uh, more to say about uh, um, alternatives, uh, better alternative, more uh, cost-effective uh, alternatives, anyone? I, I did want to say that uh, they, when they dismiss some of the ideas in the community, for instance, there is a $1.6 million project going on at the top of uh, the the Manoa Valley to remove the invasive Albizia and Myconia being done by the, the, I think, DOFA now. And when they dismiss that as not having any impact on flood mitigation, uh, sometimes it has a negative impact on those kind of projects getting funding. And it should be really made clear, and I think the Army Corps is trying to do that, that these things may help, but since they're not directly connected to the rivers that they can inc uh, incorporate them into the plan, but they have to be very careful not to dismiss these other things that are going on and harm them by their dismissal. So I just like to make that point that those things are valid and they do help. And that's what I think Luciano has been saying is that we need the city and the state who are overseeing those programs to get on board too and say that they do help with the flood mitigation. Yeah, you know, all agencies involved and yes. listening to the mm -hmm. community that will be yeah. most impacted by by that, like, uh, you know, folks like Dave's property, for instance, you know, and others and, uh, you know, safety for like uh, schools, high schools, uh, middle schools, whatever schools. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. They attend each other meetings, and we, if, if we ask questions, they even answer. But it's coffee shop discussion because it's not a recorded in document that, that we can see on how they collaborate for an integrated management plan that deals with flood mitigation, um, ecosystem announcement, and pollution abatement, and also cultural protection. This is what is missing. Not only that, but a lot of study and community work was done uh, years ago that uh, don't uh, that uh, have not been processed by the three entity uh, because uh, half of the work for the management is is available. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, we have to wrap up because uh, <laughs> we've let out of time. Sydney, Dave, uh, Luciano, Mahalo Nuweloa. It's been um, you know a pleasure, uh, you know, talking to you, uh, even though it was uh, remotely. But I uh, hope to see you at some point as well. Okay, to our thank viewers. Thank you so much. Mahalo Nuweloa and uh, aloha. Aloha. Thank you. Oh, thank you.